Good day, my name is Clivia Torres and I am a clinical licensed social worker and today I will be doing a presentation on dementia friendly communities. I actually am working with some colleagues on the Bridge um, program, HRSA Web program, and some of our presentations include comprehensive geriatric assessments, wellness and functional abilities, interprofessional teams and interprofessional care of older adults, geriatric syndromes, and clinically um, culturally and linguistically competent health care of older adults. And as I mentioned earlier, today I will be talking about the dementia-friendly communities. They are, this presentation is sponsored by um, the Health Resources and Services Administration of the United States um, Department of Health and Human Services. And it's part of a grant that we received. Um, I have no conflict of interest. And um, some of the commonly used acronyms that we may be using throughout the presentation include HRSA, GWEP, BRIDGE, SEAT, the four M's, BRIDGE, IT, ADRD, BRIDGE GAP, ECHO, and the SLN. So what matters to the f adults, especially older adults, is the um, four M's, meaning what matters to them, the medication that they're taking, the mentation, and their mobility. What's very important for us to recognize is that it's extremely important for us to stop elder um, discrimination, ageism towards older adults, because a lot of us take it for granted that older adults are not active or actively involved in community services, but that's actually a myth and a misconception. Older adults are extremely involved in many different facets of life. So for example, I'm going to present a case in the community. An older adult with the early stages of dementia presents to your clinic and tells you that he is socially isolated, that he is at the brink of being homeless, that he is experiencing financial problems, he's unable to pay for his medications, and he has no relationship with his or her, her immediate um, or extended family members due to some past family histories. So, what would you do? And do you think that you are prepared to deal with this challenge and with the patient? For years, many people were struggling with their family members who were being diagnosed with um, dementia, Alzheimer's, and for years, people did not understand what the behavior was or what some of the symptoms were, were. However, the government actually did listen and what they did is that they actually have created what they call dementia-friendly communities in which a great deal of services are provided to the family members, the caregivers, and most importantly, the patient. What's always important to recognize as doctors, medical students, and professionals working with older adults is that we always have to treat adults with dignity and with respect. We always have to choose our actions based on our values and our ethics. We always have to provide great medical care to aging adults. We always have to demonstrate empathy and compassion to the adults that we're working with. What matters mostly is that we have a clear understanding of the medical and psychosocial needs to make a well-informed plan for the patient. So for example, that patient that I presented, some of the things that he may need is, or her, either one may need is to be referred to a social worker or a therapist so they can maybe, you know, and try to engage and with their family members or try to get some support within the community. What is a friendly, a dementia-friendly community? Uh, it's a community where people with dementia feel welcomed and safe. They are valued, they are respected, and they are involved in their community. You will provide appropriate services are available for the patient, family members, and the caregivers. The environment fosters a supportive quality of life. The um, Dementia Friendly Association, I mean America, is a national network of communities, organizations, and individuals seeking to ensure across the United States that are, they are equipped to support people living with dementia and the caregivers. 
The movement was administered by the National Association of Area Agencies on Agent 1. They wanted to basically have an increased awareness of people being diagnosed with dementia and Alzheimer's in recent years. Communities have struggled on how to best support the patient, the family members, and the communities, and the caregivers in a gentle, supportive, and self-assuring manner. In a dementia-friendly community, like I indicated before, most community members are informed and they understand what dementia is. They provide measures for a nurturing and supportive environment for the families. And also they help identify neighbors that may be able to help those that are afflicted with the disease. They, in, in, in a dementia-friendly um, America or communities, they have medical services that are provided. They have long-term care services that are provided. They actually have um, count consulting. They have hospitals. They provide transportation. And all the community basically works together to provide the services and to help the family members and the patients feel welcome rather than stay home being isolated. Because as we all know and recognize, it's very important for all of us to have social interaction on a daily basis. On the local city and state level, what's important is for the agencies to plan and implement services that support the person with dementia. What's also important is for them to reduce the caregiver stress by providing adequate home care in the home for the person with dementia. What's also important is to create a community where all the people can live peacefully and feel safe. Many people that have dementia or Alzheimer's, when unsupervised, they tend to wander. So what's really important is to make sure that they have services or people within the community that can help reunite the person that may get lost or confused within the community with their family members immediately. It's also important to include community members, people that have dementia, their families and their caregivers, so they can help plan, assess the services and the needs of the community, and also to finalize the decisions for the community. They can also improve the transportation options for people with, that have dementia. They can provide transportation for the person with dementia, be it ambulance service, taxi service, and what they should also do is provide services for the loved one to accompany the patient. They need to create public spaces where the signs are really easy to read and understand. The sidewalks should be flat, smooth, and wide to prevent falls. Public places should be easily, easily identifiable for the person with dementia. The signs should have large graphic symbols and there should be a color contrast so the person can understand that you know everything doesn't blend in for them. For furniture, we need to ensure that it has plenty of arm and backrest to help the person get up easily and prevent falling. They also need to create roads for those people that enjoy walking and bicycling. The crossways should have audible cues to alert people when it's safe to cross and appropriate timing. As we all know, many people that have um, dementia, they tend to sh um, they shift or they walk slowly and they drag their feet. So it's really important to have appropriate timing for that. They also need to plan for the older adults as, when they are no longer able to drive safely because of the dementia or the Alzheimer's or other medical conditions that they may have. But what's also really important to recognize is that the mission is also to reduce the social isolation and to help maintain independence for older adults, especially those with dementia, as long as possible. Housing should be safe, should be affordable, and it should be easily accessible. The, designs should, the design features should um, allow a person to recognize what their space around them. Mobility should be um, easy for them. 
um, the sensory and cognitive impairment is something also that they have to take into account when creating new housing, especially for people that have dementia and Alzheimer's. What's important when we're developing housing is to try to coordinate the efforts of different disciplines and professionals so everyone can give their idea as to what a good and successful housing looks like for a person that has dementia and Alzheimer's. For example, when they're doing, when they're um, in the kitchen, they need to ensure that the kitchen is um, safe, that things are not just going to fall out, or that the person can reach, you know, whatever it is that they're looking for. The bedroom should not be cluttered. The bedroom should just have, if possible, like a bed and a dresser. It should not be cluttered because the person can easily fall. The same things, like if they have any TV, um, television, I like the um, electrical cords and things like that. The living room should also be very simple for the person that has dementia so they can just move around easily. And it should be in furniture, like with a style that they rec uh, recognize that this is the place that I need to sit, that I can watch TV. The living room, if possible, I mean the television, if possible, should be contained in the living room. And the dementia-friendly communities, they also would want to have wellness programs for people so they can stay fit, they can exercise, and they can also help reduce the severity of the disease. They have to provide sufficient home care in the person's home because that will help reduce the stress for the caregiver and it will also help reduce the anxiety or the agitation that the patient with dementia may be experiencing. What's crucial is to provide a support network to those with dementia and their respective caregivers. They have what they call Dementia Friends, which are programs that are being created, especially in New York, where neighbors look out for each other, especially for those that may have um, dementia and Alzheimer's or other related illnesses. And it allows the person to stay in their environment and in their home in a safe manner. In New York City, um, Presbyterian Senior Services is implementing such a program in a housing development in Brooklyn. I am aware that there is also a similar program being implemented in West, in West Harlem, okay, in Manhattan. And what they want to do is have support groups um, that also are created for the person with dementia and their family members. What we need to understand is that a person that has dementia, there are different stages to the disease. So if the person is in the first stage or the, even the second stage, they may be able to still engage and talk and share ideas, and they should be given an, an environment that they can do that safely. What happens with some of the patients is that sometimes when they get the diagnosis of dementia, they isolate. They do not want to share their experiences or what's going on with them with their loved ones. And it's actually important for families and the patient to recognize that it's really important for them to share it because other people in the community or other family members may be able to lend a hand when necessary. What's also important for the community is to be able to offer a lot of seminars, okay, in different languages on advanced directives, legal and financial planning, because that also lives, um, gives the family members the opportunity, or the caregivers also, the opportunity to plan ahead. And it's basically the wishes should be respected of what the patient will want. What we always have to keep in mind is that what's important is what the patient wants or what the patient would want. We basically have to try, if we can, to get an assessment or have a discussion with the patient, okay, before he gets to the point that he cannot make his wishes known. For example, transportation services. The transportation services should allow the patient um, that has dementia to travel along with a caregiver or a family member. If possible, they should make sure that the drivers or the transit drivers of the bus or the private taxi companies or the ambulance services, that they're trained and sensitized to the passengers and understand that the person with dementia may move a lot slower, 
may not converse in a lot of discussion or conversation or may appear confused. So what's important is for that driver to recognize that when they're dropping the person off in the hospital or wherever it is that they need to go to, that there's someone there to receive them on the receiving end. Uh, the transportation, if at all possible, would not require the person with dementia to handle any kind of money and that their companions can travel for free. Because people that have dementia, sometimes they have trouble making change and handling their finances. So what's important is for communities to ensure that transportation services for people with dementia are well advertised, that they're promoted, and that they are made available to all people that qualify. What's also important is, if possible, is for the transportation services to provide appointment schedule reminders. They can call the person and remind them, or they can call the family member or the caregiver and remind them. And it's also important to try to have someone available to help them when they get to get picked up or when they're being dropped off at their um, destination. What's also very important is to make sure that there's support and help for the caregivers who then have to address the, when the time comes for the loved one when he is no longer able to drive. As we know that this creates a real challenge for a lot of family members because the person with dementia does not want to give up the right to drive and it creates a lot of family stress and a lot of family tension. So what's really important is to make sure that there are avenues and vehicles in place that the, pa that the family members can use to help the person understand that they can no longer ride, um, drive their car and also to maybe speak with the doctor or to just find ways of taking the keys away without creating a lot of um, tension and resentment on the part of the patient, okay? In New York City, there was, there's a service called Accessoride, okay, that people sometimes that qualify for dementia and Alzheimer's can use. The only criteria is that someone has to help the person get into the vehicle when they are being picked up, and that there is someone picking them up when they arrive upon their destination. Um, in New York City, I know that some of the insurance companies do provide transportation for the person um, when they're visiting a doctor. In seniors, um, some of the senior transportation can look like, for example, that they actually have certain buses in which they have people that are trained on how to deal with the people that do have the dementia, and they sort of know, like, the local stops, they know where the people want to go, and they recognize this person if they're traveling on a daily basis, like if they're going to a senior center, or you know, if they have mild cognitive, that they're still able to do that. But with the uh, buses, it would be a friendly face that they would greet them every morning. In some communities, what they're actually doing is that they are basically, they have their own, you know, transportation mode, and they actually group the people, they bought, help them get on the bus and they take them wherever it is if they want to go to like the market, if they want to go to the doctor's appointment, or if they want to go get their hair done or whatever. But there, in some communities, they actually have their own transportation that they pick them up and they take them where they need to. They have someone there with them while they're de getting you know, their hair done or their nails done or whatever it is that they would like to or wherever it is that they're at. And then they gather them at the end of the day and they return them back home. The communities that we deal with are made up of um, a lot of different health and medical providers. So for example, hospitals, private clinics, nursing homes, and a doctor's office it's usually the first place that a, a person with dementia may be diagnosed. The providers uh, continue to provide medical care to the person that has dementia. Communities should provide education, counseling, and support for the caregivers at different locations, in different languages, and at different times. Sometimes you have many webinars or you have activities, but they're geared for like the morning. You know, when people either may be working, the caregivers may be working, and they're not able to attend. So it's really important to provide different time slots so all of these services and education can be provided. 
It's also really important to refer individuals and caregivers to community resources, okay? What's also important to recognize is that police officers and first responders should be trained to recognize the signs of dementia and respond accordingly. What's also important is that if a loved one does have um, dementia or Alzheimer's and the family can register them with the uh, um, Safety Wanderer program or like with a medic alert bracelet. In New York City, there is an agency called Caring Kind and they basically have a program that if a person does, um, is diagnosed with dementia or Alzheimer's, they can be registered. And what that does is it provides all their medical information and, you know, contact information. And if they wander and get lost and then they're found, they can be reunited with their loved one in a timely fashion. And police officers can also, you know, look in the missing persons database. In terms of businesses and bank personnel, what's important to recognize is that some people, some patients that have dementia and Alzheimer's, go to the bank frequently to, to withdraw money. And sometimes they don't f they forget that they went the previous day to withdraw money. So what's important is, if possible, is to have bank personnel assigned specifically to deal with older adults that may be having signs of dementia or Alzheimer's. And what the, the purpose of that is that they can make contact with the family members and they can call them and say, your loved one is here trying to withdraw money again, you know, and we just want to alert you to the fact, or your loved one is here and they were confused, they don't remember their um, PIN number, so maybe, you know, you need to come and pick them up. It's also important to make sure that the banks and the personnel um, work with caregivers to ensure that the person that has dementia is not being financially exploited by someone, either a family member or a friend, because that can happen. In the post office, for example, it's important to recognize that sometimes people go there to pick up stamps and money orders or to mail stuff, and they can also be confused. So even if they have one or two um, staff members in the post office that are trained that can recognize a person that is confused and may need help and try to assist the person as best as they can. They can connect them with their family, like is there someone I can call that can come and pick you up? They can alert your supervisor. And if it's that the person really is appearing very confused and they may not know how to get home, maybe they can call the police and, and hopefully it will not be in a threatening manner that they respond, but it's really important to make sure that the person can get back home safely. In the religious in, um, leaders and institutions, um, it's also important to, for them to help raise awareness of dementia. Um, we do recognize that a lot of people that have dementia and Alzheimer's enjoyed going to church at one time, and sometimes they do not go because they get confused, they do not know how to get there, or even being in the church itself or in service, they just can't keep up with like the um, sermon and with the um, mass or whatever. So it's really important that the leaders and the institutions help raise awareness and by and educating the other fellow um, members or the other parishioners of what's going on with their um, loved ones or with like people that are in the congregation. So it's really important to help reduce stigma by discussing what is dementia. And if possible, to invite a person or a family member that is living with dementia, share their story. Because sometimes, you know, you may observe and you may notice that a person's behavior is not the norm and you don't know how to approach that person. And in the church environment, also the leaders and, and the institutions, they can help connect families that may have dementia with a caregiver in the congregational and the group that can show empathy and that can provide support and that may be available to help that person, okay? It's also important to encourage parishioners to wear name tags because like that the person may be able, he may forget your name, but if he sees your name tag, he may or she may be able to recall your name. What's important is that it's important to provide support to the patient, to their loved ones, caregivers and family members, and to the community as a whole.
A dementia-friendly community can also use the help of restaurants, grocery stores, and libraries. For example, the staff can offer services and they can lend support to encourage access with independence. They can deliver the food to the person that has dementia and at a later date, the family may be able to pay the tab, okay? Or with the understanding that the family member, you know, will set up and will pick out the food to be delivered to the family, I mean, to the patient, and then they will settle with the store later. It's just a new philosophy that, you know, we're asking people to think, we're asking people to think outside the norm to help welcome people with dementia and Alzheimer's in their communities. In the libraries, you can also have someone um, in the library that may, you know, notice that a person is confused, and one of the librarians may just approach the patient or, you know, the customer and say, is it possible that I can help you? You know, is there anyone I can call for you that can maybe come and pick you up? And it does take a lot of courage to approach someone, but if we all want to be able to help each other, especially those people that are afflicted with dementia and Alzheimer's, it's really important that we make the effort to do so. Employers. As we know, there are many people that struggle on a daily basis with going to work or taking care of a loved one at home. So what we're asking employers is, uh, and what we're asking employers is to be a little bit more flexible and allowing people to come in late if possible to stagger their hours or to allow them to just you know take time off when they need to deal with their loved one that may have dementia and Alzheimer's. The behavior and the mood of a person with dementia and Alzheimer's fluctuates, and it can fluctuate on a daily basis. So it's really important for employers to understand that. What we are requesting, and at least if possible, is for the um, employers to be supportive of the caregivers by implementing changes to their personnel policies. For example, that if I'm taking time off to care for my loved one at home, I do not run the risk of losing my job because I'm taking too much time off or allowing me to use my time, my personal or you know time um, intermittently. So like if I have to accompany my loved one to an appointment, I'm able to do so and then I can come back to work. And of course, with all this um, said, we need to have proper documentation for our employers. Housing, um, like in New York City, there, is, um, there are places like assisted living, independent living, facilities where a person with dementia can live. Most of them, uh, the assisted livings, do not accept Medicaid, okay, so it's private pay. The ones that do accept Medicaid, like the um, nursing home, the independent livings, there are a few that do accept Medicaid and Medicare. So it's a challenge because there are times that a family member wants to put, in, wants to put their loved one in a facility because they're unable to keep them at home, but then it's really important to figure out the money involved and how do I go about doing that. And what we, it's really important for us to recognize is that as the disease progresses, a person that was living in independent housing, okay, may need to now be moved to a more restrictive environment, more like a residential setting where there is a lot more support. Because as we know, with dementia and Alzheimer's, the disease does progress. So it's really important for family members and even um, the staff at the independent living to recognize that there are going to be changes. In the, um, the direct care staff at the care facilities usually receive specific dementia training on how to deal with the uh, clients that are living in those facilities. In the independent living communities, for example, it's aging adults that are self-sufficient and they can still perform their ADLs, generally live in that type of housing. But once a person has dementia, or Alzheimer's, they may need to be moved to a more restrictive environment. The assisted living communities is where aging adults receive an intermediate level of care that can provide hands-on assistance with some ADLs. And these facilities usually provide the care, but at an additional cost. And in New York City, a lot of the assisted um, living um, locations are extremely expensive. What's important to recognize is that 
The rooms in the assisted living are generally private and skilled nursing care is not provided. A person with dementia that lives in assisted living will move to a facility that offers a higher level of care when he or she, uh, sh when he or she starts experiencing falls, when they wander, when they display aggressive um, behavior towards others, and when they constantly require assistance with their ADLs and with their um, IADLs. There's also what they call the specialized memory care. And those are facilities in the community that, and they can be also a wing in an assisted living facility or a continuing care campus that offers multiple levels of care in one location. The purpose of these facilities is to provide long-term residential care to the aging adult with moderate or long-term dementia. There is more supervision, which is important, and there's a secure facility to prevent the patients or the residents from wandering. Staff is well trained. They know how to deal with difficult behavior. They also know how to diffuse difficult situations. They have the skills to communicate effectively with the person with dementia, and they recognize signs that indicate a change in the person's physical or mental health. Nursing homes or skilled nursing home facilities this facility offers the highest level of long-term care. There is around-the-clock supervision, skilled nursing care, and there's total assistance with the ADLs. They, the staff at some of these sites can administer medications, IVs, injections, they, do, they provide wound care, and other medical care that is not offered in um, the other facilities. The person with dementia may be incontinent, may be unable to walk without assistance. They may be unable to effectively communicate and feed themselves. So they depend on the um, help of the skilled nursing home workers. Like I was talking about the four M's, what matters? So what matters is to know and align each older adult's specific health um, outcome goals and care preferences. And in terms of medication, it's really important to make sure that you review the medication that the older adults are taking because you also don't want the person to be taking too much medication, which can contribute to, some, to falls at times. So it's really important to review the list of medications. Mentation, it's really important to try to prevent, sorry about that, prevent, identify, and treat, and manage dementia, depression, and delirium. Okay, and it's also mobility. It's also, we need to ensure that the older adults move safely and every day that they move and that they do it in a safe manner. You don't want them to fall because as we all know, it's really difficult for an older adult to recover. Social participation in the dementia-friendly America communities. They have organized activities that are precise, appropriate, and are geared for the needs of the people with dementia. You have services which, which allow people with dementia to participate in community life. You lend emotional support to the family or the caregiver, and even to the patient. A person with mild cognitive impairment who can travel on their own can attend a senior center. Many of the activities are done independently, and the person can get breakfast or lunch for a nominal fee. Any adult over 60 can register and can become a member. In the adult day programs, they basically um, provide transportation and they provide the same services, but they actually pick up the person in the morning in their home and then they also bring them back home at the end of the day. And what they ask is that someone is there to receive the patient so the patient does not get lost. In terms of social activities and participation, we need to recognize that older adults need sensory stimulation. They need to exercise. We can always listen to music because music makes us very happy at times, okay? And it's very important to play music that the person with dementia enjoyed. Um, we can engage them in art activities. We can also just, you know, do a scrapbook, look through pictures, and let, just listen to them talk. Very important. And we also need to recognize that they need to socialize with older adults. It's social um, interaction is very, very important. In terms of respect and social inclusion, 
the dementia-friendly um, um, America communities, they want to raise awareness of what dementia is. They want to raise um, awareness in the communities, and they want to provide a lot of support to the people, the caregivers, and the family members. It's really important for people to feel validated that they're contributing to their community and that they can develop new friendships or new relationships and even new support groups. The entire community will have a better understanding of dementia. They can easily recognize the signs and they're willing to help the people that have dementia. In some communities, they actually um, put signs throughout the community, like you know where the restrooms are, where the restaurants are, if they have a lot of benches throughout them so people can take a break and take a rest. The civic and participation and employment, like I said, the person with dementia, if possible, should continue working in their capacity and to the best of their ability. They are encouraged to live independently and with a purpose. A person with dementia is encouraged to volunteer their time based on their interests and ability for as long as they can. We recognize that some people with dementia and with Alzheimer's may not be able to continue working, but there are some that can continue working if they get the support for the, from their employers and their family members and friends. What's really important to understand when you're communicating with a person that has dementia is to avoid explanations and rationales. For example, you say it simply and to the point and you allow them time to process it, okay? And you, before you ask them another question, you try to make sure that they understood what you said. And we have to affirm the person's message to you. And what's really important to recognize is that it is not worthwhile arguing with a person that has dementia or Alzheimer's. You can sort of try to find ways to redirect them. What is thought diversity? Thought diversity is basically people of diverse cultures, different social economic groups and communities that get together to meet, express their viewpoints, and utilize their skill set collectively to decide the best form of treatment and involvement in the community for a person with dementia. And we try to provide this, and we try to encourage this, so we are basically ensuring that there's fairness, equality, justice, and integrity, and that services are available to all people. And I actually, oh, so, and when you're working with people um, that have dementia and um, Alzheimer's, they have what is called the action team, which is the person with dementia, the family members, but then we have the local government, working with them, legal and financial workshops or seminars, the hospitals be, should be working with them, home care, the faith, like I said, the religion, the religious leaders and institutions. We have diverse and underserved populations, community services, community member, the clinics, the caregiver support and services, businesses, residential settings, which is the homes and apartments, and the local government. And they all have to work together. Also, when you're working with um, older adults that have dementia and Alzheimer's, it's really important to hire staff that is skilled and that have time to care. You want a partnership working with the family, the patient, the caregiver, and friends. An assessment with early identification of dementia. That's crucial to help a person that does have dementia. A care plan, what is the next step? What is it that we're going to do to make sure that the person that has been diagnosed with the disease can live a productive life, can get the services that they need? And it's also the environment. We need to ensure that the environment is friendly and that it's not going to put the person at, with dementia at risk. Dementia-friendly communities, the missing piece, it's basically an effort that we all have to take and it's, I mean, that we all have to work on and we all have to work collectively to make sure that all the services are provided for the family members, the patients. I came across this and I really thought that this was a nice way to end the um, presentation. And it says, to care for those who once cared for us is one of the highest honors. 
And then I also, and that's by Tia Walker. And I also came across this, caring for our seniors is perhaps the greatest responsibility we have. Those who walked before us have given so much and made possible the life we all enjoyed. And that's by John, John Hoeven. Sorry if I said it wrong. And that concludes my presentation. And thank you very much and have a great day.